Hello, and welcome to the second and final day of Muse Meets. It's my delight to be here with the Executive Director of Hopkins Press, Barbara Klein-Pope. Welcome, Barbara. Thanks, Wendy. So nice to be here and uh, to be here with so many people at Muse Meets this year. Great. Um, for those I have not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Wendy Queen, and I am the Director of Project Muse. As many of you are aware, Project Muse was born of a collaboration between Hopkins Press and the library back in the mid 90s through generous grants from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our initial goal was to support the digital presence of Hopkins Press journals. And since that time, we have expanded the platform to include hundreds of publishers and different content types, most notably books. Being part of a university is very much an integral part of the Muse brand. What we haven't talked about very often are the benefits of Muse being part of a university press and how that impacts our strategic vision, creates efficiencies, and positions Muse to fully understand and embrace the world of not-for-profit not for profit publishing that we support. And as we discuss several topics today, I encourage questions in the Q&A chat as I'll leave ample time at the end. So I'll just get straight to the heart of the conversation. Barbara, why do you think Muse is better as a part of a university press versus being a standalone organization? Well, Wendy, as you know, uh, being part of a university, university press means that you have a journals publisher down the hall from you, right? So you can go and talk to Bill Breckner about S2O or any other projects that um, are upcoming or, or how it might be better to present a project to a book publisher. And all you have to do then is, is to come downstairs and come over to this building that I'm in and, and have a conversation with a book publisher. And I think we're also ready partners for experimentation. And that's important also for me is to be able to have a user group uh, right here, uh, a publisher user group for experimentation. The other thing I think is important is that Muse as one of our four um, divisions here at the press has an opportunity for, to, to um, participate in press-wide activities. So for example, this year we had an internship that was based around our equity, justice and inclusion goals. And even though the leadership of that internship was in the books division, uh, I think Muse really benefited from that. And we in, in, in books and journals and Muse together benefited from that. So, and of course, Muse was part of our strategic assessment of our entire press in 2018, 2019, and then the building our strategic plan. And I think having a press-wide strategic plan has really helped as we look at the specific strategies for Muse. And so I think having um, publishers at our fingertips for Muse really helps us be more successful for, for all of our publishers on Muse. So is there anything that, that you would add to that? What, what, what do you think is important about Muse being you know, one of the four divisions of a, of a university press? Well, I agree with your answer. Um, I'll also emphasize the efficiencies and cost savings. I sometimes think, what would it take for all of the benefits that we have being inside a press, being inside a university? What if we had to pay for that individually as an organization? And that allows us to put as much money back into the ecosystem. So since we run very modestly, the support from being embedded, it allows us to return as much to the publishers and to keep our increases to the libraries modest as well. So we're always, it's, it's a very delicate balance there. And I'll also reiterate that it's an amazing position to be in as an aggregator to hear daily the strategies and challenges of our journals and books divisions. And um, I'll expand that question a little bit and include the benefits of working within a university as that allows us to align and seek advice from the library editorial boards, faculty connections, and to actively participate in conversations about the scholarly communications landscape. And there's two areas that I have found that to be the most helpful in, in the areas of EJI and open access. 
So let's follow up a little bit on EJI. Um, EJI is, is woven throughout the entire strategic plan of the press, as you know. It's the foundation for our values, the foundation for our vision. Uh, it's one of our strategic initiatives, but then it's also woven into the other, other four strategic initiatives. And I often get asked about this aspect of the press, the, e the equity, justice, inclusion, diversity aspect of the press. And so um, I think it'd be interesting if you could share what about those concepts are most important to news. Okay. Um, since EJI is such a broad topic, I'll hit it from two different points. I'll cover people and I'll cover content. So for the content aspect of EJI, um, we're working to attract EJI focused journals for our planning around the subscribe to open planning grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and that really, when we were writing that grant, focused on EJI from those two perspectives, making more content available to more people and making sure the content offered through Subscribe to Open highlights EJI principles. Um, to define what those EJI principles are is quite hard, and that's something we're still struggling with. But um, I think having a, a press and a university to help define those principles is another area that's really going to help us be successful at um, what we started out with in that grant, what we intend with that grant. Um, and, you know, as importantly, I'll say being part of the press affords Muse the opportunity to embed those principles in our culture um, and have that flow through every aspect of our staff's daily lives as part of the office. But I'll let you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, before I do that, I just want to touch on I think it'd be interesting in the Q&A session to get comments about how others are defining the EJI for their content. I think we could really benefit from that and benefit as a community to have that conversation. I think that would be super helpful. Um, but on the EJI side, I, I just want to say press-wide, we just hired uh, our very first uh, Director of People, Culture, and Equity. And her name is Julia Linton-Brown, and I think she's here on News Meets with us. Um, learning more about the publishing world, but um, she's going to continue our work in this area in culture and EJI, and she brings such energy and expertise that I think we're going to thrive under her leadership. And I could say too that she's just one person, but as we have been working on culture and dignity and EJI, you know, for two or three years at this point, we have lots of staff members who are super interested in this area and are participating and will continue to volunteer. So I think there are activities that at this point, Julia will help lead, um, will be benefited from, from that work that we've done in the past. And these activities at this point range from making sure that every single one of our open positions has a really diverse candidate pool. And as you said, all the way to weaving EJI into uh, the content that we publish. And of course, that extends to Muse in the content that we're posting and in that content that we choose to highlight, uh, for example, in Muse and Focus and various other programs and, and marketing that we do. Right. And I hope everyone has the opportunity to um, learn more about the Hopkins internship program and the work that Julia is doing. Um, I think I'm going to vote for the press putting on a webinar about that. Um, because it really has made um, an impact very quickly. So, um, and moving on, um, open access is a big topic for all of us. As a fairly new executive director of the press, about four years now, one of the aspects of your professional accomplishments coming to the press that intrigued me was your ability at the National Academies to offer digital content for free while remaining fiscally responsible. Um, something that has is, is been quite a struggle for the humanities. Um, being new to the humanities, what do you think your biggest challenge has been adapting a similar approach here at the press? So first I'll say um, four years sounds like a, a long time actually, but I, I still feel quite new and, and quite new to the humanities. So. 
Um, I'm going to take this question in two parts and talk a little bit about uh, the work at the National Academies for those who don't know about that. Uh, just a you know a couple of sentences about that, and then and then I'll tackle the humanities aspect of of open access and the challenges and opportunities that that I see there. So the work at the National Academies took over a decade. Um, we started uh, trying to make our all of our content, the 250 books that we published every year, open. We started that in the year 2000 and finally ended up getting our bestsellers out to the world, to everybody in the world for free in 2011. So this was a really long, careful and carefully researched process. And at that time, there were no models to crib from. So um, we ended up using multiple models as we worked through the research and the experimenting. And one of those models ended up being similar to what we now know as an APC model, uh, where we were able to charge some of the um, production costs of the books to the researchers' grants. So the National Academies works 80% on grants. It's a $300 million organization, so there's lots and lots of grants in there. And so we were able to use that APC-type model internally to help make things sustainable. For some books, as we were you know, pulling different types of books out of our list and, and experimenting with them, we determined that if we released some of those books um, to certain markets, that we wouldn't lose money doing that. And so we did that for an experiment. And then after we did it, we measured the effect of it. And then we took some books and released them to all markets and measured that. And so little by little, after this careful research, and this research was done in collaboration with P.K. Kanan, who was a marketing professor at the University of Maryland. So we had very robust methodology for all of this. Um, and, and we really um, embraced certain models along the way for things that made sense. But all of that content was in the sciences, some of it in, in K through 12 education, some of it in higher education, but it was almost all in the sciences. So let's, let's talk about the humanities now. And as we all know, humanists aren't scientists. They have very different ways of working. Their funding models are radically different. And so we can't just take the experience that my team had at the National Academies and just apply it to humanities and expect it to work. We need to do that same, that same careful research and that same careful work to figure out exactly how we can make this work most sustainably, not just within the publishing community, but also within the library community. And so one of the reasons it's so different is that as we learned yesterday and we've known is that humanists don't have money for APCs. We've also learned over the time, over those decades, that APCs tend not to be equitable. And so it's really fortunate that we have the opportunity to have complementary models that are more equitable, and that would be subscribe to open, which we talked a lot about yesterday, and also direct to open, which is the MIT model for monographs. And those models repurpose the money within the system and apply it to open access. And so I really hope that, that those models work and that they take off. But if they don't, we'll come up with other models and, and experiment with those models and move forward and, and really have the researchers you know, joined at the hips with us to make sure that we're doing, doing this careful research. But I, I just really wanna say something generally about OA and, and we really have to get this figured out. So think about it, misinformation is all free to read. And most of the evidence-based knowledge is gated. And there's really something wrong with that. And I think our, our world would be a different place um, if there were equal access and equal access to knowledge, no matter whether that knowledge is peer reviewed or not. So um, just wanted to say that, you know, as sort of a conclusion to OA for, from my part, but, um, What's your take on OA and, and do you have a favorite flavor of OA? I appreciate your sentiments about the misinformation and um, um, how we're all here to help with that, that problem. So in terms of OA, I don't have a favorite flavor per se. I've focused the last six years 
on supporting and experimenting as much as possible. Like everyone else, trying to keep going, keep going. You know what you want to see happen, but you don't have a clear vision without those experimentations or those experiments to see how it's going to um, play out. And Muse Open allowed us to create the infrastructure to support many flavors, but at Muse, we have not yet hit what I would consider the right note to make a substantial impact to move beyond a handful of titles or presses and towards a more programmatic approach. Um, and as an aggregator, I believe Muse needs to lead that initiative as well as support those of our partner pub publishers. Um, the work surrounding S2O has me confident we can do that, support many journals to have more open access options, right? Will it be the flavor that hits all journals? No, it won't. But can it hit a, enough journals that we can make an impact? That is the goal. Um, and we'll always continue to experiment and support initiatives coming directly from our partner publishers like Central European University Presses opening the future. Um, but most importantly, through many of my subscribe to open conversations, the one thing I keep walking away from is all of this is contingent on community support for Muse. Um, it isn't, unless we get that support from our publishers, from our libraries, um, that it will be very hard to pull off in a scalable way. Um, and this is just solving sort of the journals side of the house. So this leads me to another question as Muse Open started as support for monographs and has expanded across the platform, but we haven't moved as fast as I would like on the monographs front either. It's sort of in that same description as the journals, like we haven't quite hit scale there as well. So my question to Barbara would be, and I think appropriate for a executive press director, that the monograph has been in trouble for decades from a business standpoint, from a press director standpoint. Will OA finally save it? Well, of course, I don't know for sure, but I think that it can certainly help. And, and maybe I could say yes, but, but indirectly. And while many of us on this uh, Zoom call in this meeting know the sad story of the monograph, I'd like to just kind of summarize that story very quickly and use an analogy for those who are new to this world. Um, I'm cognizant that um, there are interns, for example, on this, on this uh, in, in Muse Meets. And so I want to make sure that people are kind of on the same page as we talk about this monograph issue. So at, at, as you said, Wendy, we've needed uh, support for monographs for a really long time and long before we were even thinking about OA. And one of the reasons that most university presses need support from their universities is because of the drop in demand from libraries for monographs. So as libraries got a better handle on usage or maybe you should say lack thereof, it made sense that their buying habits could change. This, this was a, you know, a long time ago. Some, some people probably you know, on this call weren't even born <laughs> when the monograph was thriving. Um, but to use an analogy, if, if you figured out, Wendy, that your son was no longer eating yogurt and that yogurt was just sitting on the refrigerator shelf, you know, day after day, you, you'd no longer buy that yogurt. And if all teenagers or all people as a group shunned yogurt, yogurt companies would go out of business. That's just how the marketplace works. And we know that. And if that happened in your house and you no longer bought yogurt, your, your son would eat Cheetos instead. And and that's okay, and maybe that happens. Um, but the monograph, unlike yogurt, has a function outside market forces, and monographs need to be published for academia to function, no matter if the demand for them is there in the marketplace. So even if we learn through that rigorous research I was talking about as we were talking about OA, so let, let's say we learn that open access has very little effect on the sales of printed books, university presses are still gonna need that funding to continue to publish monographs because they're not adequately, adequately supported um, by the marketplace. So we as university presses don't just go out of business like a yogurt company would if the monograph um, doesn't sell. 
So they're essential, they are, are truly essential for promotion and tenure in academia. And currently the, the deficit in publishing those monographs is paid for by universities that have university presses and from entrepreneurial university presses who are covering those costs by delivering content in, in innovative ways. And so university presses are, are making money on certain things and applying that so that they can publish this important monographic work. And the universities, in some cases, are providing a budget to those university presses in order to make this whole. And really that's unfair. So scholars from universities that don't have a university press are free riding on this inequitable system. And this is partially what the Tome Project toward an open monograph ecosystem is, is, is what Tome stands for. But that's partially what the Tome Project is trying to correct, knowing that we need funding for monographs from all universities, from wherever those scholars are uh, working for the system to be uh, fair and sustainable. So obtaining funding for open access can only help to stabilize the system that is basically now broken. And at the same time, that funding for open access allows the work to be free uh, to the world to read. And that, that's pretty important. Right, more sustainable to support more readers. I might add the Cheetos scenario is more than an analogy in my life. It is a reality. Um, so speaking of readers, um, one of the first things you asked when you walked into the Muse floor at the press is how are we engaging with the millions of readers on Muse? I know that was based on your work at the National Academies where you asked readers to tell you how they plan to use the free content on the site before downloading a PDF. As you remember, my eyes got wide and I said, that's not possible because of privacy issues. You said privacy issues this is a service to those who want to engage and want to have a say in what we decide to publish in the future. Of course, I said that would ruin Muse to do this. Um, you backed off. Um, and literally this was in the first week of us meeting officially at the press. So um, is that temporary, Barbara? The backing off? Yeah. Yeah, it's temporary. <laughs> so... And, and I'm, I'm not ready to give up on this yet. And, and certainly, you know, so that was the first week and I'm in whatever week this is, week 250 or something. And, and we haven't done this, but, and I know it's gonna be difficult to convince you and libraries and other people in our community that we're not violating um, our values around privacy if a reader opts in to have a conversation with a publisher or an author. And um, I'll reiterate that at the National Academies, we used the information that we gleaned from readers about how they were using the content every single day. And those insights went back to the committees who were working on the content and to new committees who were working on similar content. And they were internalizing that as they were considering um, the facts and the evidence and, and how to best present that evidence and, and how, how to emphasize certain uh, pieces of information in the work that they were doing. And of course, the reason that we were publishing what we're publishing, the same as what the reason we're publishing what, what we're publishing here at Hopkins and across university presses is that we want to make an impact on people's lives. And we want our authors and our scholars and our researchers to realize that impact. And you know, that, that's who we're working for here. And you can't measure impact just by downloads or requests or views. You get no insight about how those people are using the content and what, what might be useful for them in the future as they're building their knowledge around the subject. And not having this information means that we're not able to really measure our impact or change what we're doing based on evidence. And so we're basically flying blind a lot of the time. So publishers like the National Academies and, and other publishers who have their content on their own sites, they have the, the privilege and the, and the resources in order to have their own site, have that ability 
to engage and to build community and to be more successful in their mission. There's a paper in PNAS, and I'll, I'll make sure that we get that to um, people in the meeting, that, that, that takes 1.6 million of the downloads, the information from, from um, the people who are downloading content and analyzes those using AI and machine learning. And, and there's lots of fabulous conclusions about how people, yes, people, you know, we, we hear all about misinformation and how terrible that's making our world. But when, when good evidence-based content is free, people engage in it and they use it. They use it in their everyday lives and they use it uh, in practice in their workplace. So that, that's pretty important. So I still wonder um, if we could do this kind of thing at Muse uh, to gain more insight um, from our readers. And if the answer is still no because of privacy, how about just for OA content? You know, that content is mostly served directly to readers. Those readers sometimes are authenticated through a library site, but oftentimes they're not. So I, I hope in the Q&A part of this, we can have a discussion about whether or not some aspect of that would be acceptable at least to do an experiment, to do a test and, and see, how that, see how that works. Um, particularly for OA content that's funded by a grant maker, I would think that the grant maker would be more likely to continue to fund OA if they had more deep insights into how the books or the journal articles are being used. So that's my, that's my request. Okay, I accept that request. I will say, I think there um, are initiatives like the open access ebook users that are, you know, establishing some governance around this topic and will make headway um, and helping us. But to answer this more generally, I would say I would want this answer to be an understanding, a conversation between libraries and publishers. Would data help the development and connect authors and readers? Like maybe, right? And, and that's important. I will need the advisement of the libraries to figure out the delicate balance. I do think, especially as we move further towards um, the OA space, that we need our need to understand the users will only increase. Um, we won't have the luxury of the libraries speaking on behalf of their users. We'll have to think about our users as the world versus a single subscription. Um, as Karen Wolf was discussing design thinking yesterday. Um, I was really glad that she did that, bringing the UX, uh, the user experience into the conversation about humanities mm -hmm. and that also bringing empathy through the UX. Um, but what that means is we need more and new ways to understand users' needs. Um, and I think that's going to be important for all of us so that um, conversation around um, protecting privacy, but also helping readers, uh, I think is going to be a very strong topic in the next couple of years for all of us. And like Barbara said, I welcome any feedback in the chat about that and any conversations about that issue after the Muse Meets meeting. Um, so Again, maybe, maybe we want to have a webinar on that just so we can, can really listen to the views across our community on um, on interacting with, with our readers and understanding um, what, what, is, what is necessary for, for publishers to best move forward, so. And anyway. where should we divide those responsibilities of protecting the privacy, yes. engaging the users and building products for the users because at Muse, the users are the least known constituent of all that we do. And I'll just say as a side note, one of the things that actually has benefited me a great deal about the internship program at the press is having users in the building and getting their feedback about the platform and about Muse Meets and about the topics and having them engage in this conversation today actually means that we've extended this conversation from beyond just publishers and librarians, but also to end users and that, that 
that makes me extremely happy um, uh, to be a little bit closer. Right, right. And in fact, you know, we were in a meeting with scholars not too long ago, and it's unusual for, for Muse to be in meetings with scholars. And there were two or three of them in there. And, and, and you remember, we were sort of all over them asking them questions because they were so happy to be interacting with those people who not only are authors of our content, but um, uh, use, use this content, use this knowledge in their own research. So anyway, I look for, forward to, oh, go ahead. Right, and I also think just stressing that OA is um, providing to audiences that we're not familiar with, I can't stress this enough, that how do we know without more data that we're providing the best reading experience, the best research experience that we possibly can. So um, that will always be uh, a concern of mine as, as we spread our audience, have we created the structures to understand those audiences? And I, I don't think we have as a community. Terrific, so I really look forward to the conversation about that, um, both at the end of this meeting and, and maybe during a webinar, a separate webinar. But, so let's talk a little bit about where you see Muse in 10 years. So what do you think? I like the question that it's 10 years because it lets me um, have fun and play and I don't have to um, have it as a three-year goal. But I'm going to say mostly, um, for Muse, I see embracing more advanced technologies, such as the work we're doing around artificial intelligence and machine learning. And you can also expand that a little bit to blockchain. Could that solve some of the data issues we were just discussing? I really hope we have enough OA offerings to support both our publishers and users, but most importantly, make sure the content on Muse can have a major impact on people's lives and OA means more people. But again, this means we need to understand the people that are using the product. Um, supporting more shared infrastructure as none of us should be trying to do everything. Better ideas come out of the collective. Um, in my opinion, an example of this would be the OAEBU that I just mentioned. Um, I'm really impressed with the work that they're doing. And um, the need, I can't stress for more standards and the work that NYSA is doing with that. And um, having the ability to partner with organizations that are very focused, right? Focused on a particular um, challenge or problem and being able to expand our knowledge base at Muse by being partnered in that way. Um, because we're not going to get the insights if it's just, you know, the people at the press at the university located in Baltimore, Maryland, like we need it much bigger than that to have broader viewpoints. Um, I want to support more content and not just books and journals. We're experimenting in the digital humanities, case studies, references, and primary sources. Um, but more importantly, There'll be other objectives or containers that'll be yet to be defined, but it'll be important to support research in the humanities. And broader than that is how do you really connect this content together in ways that's meaningful for research? We're still sort of in separate camps all the time. Is it a journal? Is it a book? Is it a case study? And you know, my view is that um, some of these containers are, while they're important for many reasons, may not be as important on a digital platform as we believe them to be currently. Um, but I mean, I could keep going and going because 10 years is really um, a wonderful time frame for me. Uh, but I'll just say our primary reason for existing is to effectively connect authors and readers. Um, as we say in the Hopkins Press vision statement, we want to ensure that knowledge enhances the lives of every person. To do that, Muse needs to be experimental, agile, and follow the needs of scholars and readers, but also stay one step ahead in many cases. We can't wait until um, a technology is fully cooked anymore before we embrace it. We need to be part of the experiments. Right, and so I wanna go back to, to your first sentence about blockchain. Um, I want to take this opportunity to ask you uh, to say a few sentences about 
how blockchain would, would be useful to use and, and maybe even explain what it is. Um, and I, 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 I know that we all embraced the internet very early on, many of us, right, in the 90s. And I think it's really important that we look to these new technologies and understand them and how they might be applied. And so I'm, I'm hoping you can enlighten us on that a bit. The more, the more I read about blockchain, chain, it seems the less I understand, so. <laughs> well, I'll say first off, I'm glad I can't see the faces of our internal technical team when I take on the role for defining this, but, um, and I can't by any means claim to be a blockchain expert, but I once heard a very smart person create a simple definition as thinking about blockchain as a ledger, recording information that is distributed across multiple points and making it difficult and some claim even impossible to change, hack, or cheat a system. Um, so, you know, as a director, one of the more fun parts of my job is thinking about the decisions we make today that ready us for the next generation of Muse and where we just had that conversation about um, user data. That's where I also see blockchain coming into this um, because it can help protect um, user privacy and control. And then further out from there, combine that with AI, can you make this powerful structure that seamlessly helps users find and connect with the content that will support their research, right? So the two of them coming together to me is, is quite exciting. And, you know, I know that we hear about blockchain a lot in the crypto world, and there's a lot of feelings around the crypto world, um, but it is a useful and intriguing approach to maximize sort of connecting the users, their privacy and the content all in one bundle. I, I just want to say too, that, that um, on the AI side, uh, that, that Muse is now using uh, AI and machine learning to help people discover content that they might not have discovered before. And that's, that's in pilot at the moment. So any of you using Muse, um, you'll, you'll notice that you now get um, recommendations that, that are derived from uh, that technology. Right, it's been exciting. It's been, um, we've been in the experimental space as um, you may have heard in one of our pre-recorded webinars for I guess about a year and a half now. So going into it at the same time being in the pandemic has been also, in some ways, just sort of a interesting combination of events. Um, but I am curious because I do have this opportunity with my boss sort of captured on video with me live. Um, where do you see Muse in 10 years? So put me on the spot. Um, but I agree with your assessment. Um, I also think that Yes, we talked about 10 years and that was my question, but I, I'll just backtrack and say that I think 10 years is a little bit too long <laughs> to, to determine where we'll be. But I think overall, it's, it's important that we figure out the ways that we can take advantage of new technologies. And you've talked about some of those technologies that we know about now. In 10 years, there'll be different technologies and be really creative in applying them to our mission and, and using those technologies around our values. And we can we could talk you know, all day about the ethics of AI and algorithms and those kinds of things. Um, but overall, we just wanna make it easier and easier for every single person on the planet to benefit from, from the knowledge that, that is produced by scholars and researchers and, and other authors. Um, but that, you know, we wanna make sure that, that that content is as useful to as many people as possible. And if we can keep that in the front of our minds um, as we assess these technologies and as we move forward, I think that's gonna be important. And so if, if that means streaming that knowledge through avatars in the metaverse, so be it. Well said. Um... So, so many provocative questions, so little time. I'm going to jump over um, to the questions and, um, and start sort of exploring some of our topics a little bit deeper. So Barbara, 
I think this one is for you. Um, in addition to your experience with OA at the academies, your background in the sciences also brings more perspective to the press. As Karen Wolf discussed the science versus humanities narrative that exists, can you give us a few examples from your experience of the sciences embracing the humanities? So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm looking at my notes from, from, from Karen Wolf's um, uh, talk yesterday and how, how a, it was just fabulous. You know, I have a lot to say about it, but, but as far as that particular question, I'll just give a quick example. Um, and there are examples across the National Academies uh, of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine where the humanities are embraced. And one of them is the fact that the, the Board on Health Sciences Policy, which produces content on health policy, um, probably 20 or 30 um, books a year, the chair of that board is Jeff Kahn, who is a professor here at Hopkins, and he's a philosopher. He runs uh, the Berman Institute for Bioethics. And so, ethicists are used on those boards to provide incredibly valuable insight. Jeff Kahn's the chair of the board. Uh, there's another person uh, at the University of Wisconsin who's an ethicist who is on that board, who's on many, many committees. And if you look at the committees that are producing the content, very often they're humanists on, on, on those committees. So that's from my experience where I see the humanities and the sciences together. Uh, but I think there are many, many other um, examples of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll let you go first with this next question, um, but then I will add to it perhaps, but how can university presses move faster? And I think that means faster towards innovation, faster to embracing a lot of the technologies or models that are uh, for-profit friends seem to be able to do much quicker than us. First instinct um, is to say that we're moving fast. <laughs> University presses are moving fast. Um, the perception that we're not seems to be deeply ingrained for some reason. Um, but uh, I, I, I think that, that, that we pedal fast. You know, we are, we are working quickly. But I also think that one of the ways in which we can get to our goals faster, perhaps, rather than just pedal faster, is to collaborate. And collaboration, um, not just among university presses and other publishers, but also uh, throughout the scholarly communication community uh, with libraries and others. Yeah, I will anyway. echo. I will echo collaboration and extend it to community. And um, like I touched on earlier, the sort of not all of us trying to do everything and sort of partnering in the most efficient ways um, to let us focus on sort of our, our strengths, um, what part we can do super well. Um, and that it's not surprising coming from somebody that's a director of an aggregation because that's our that's our whole goal. Goal, like, what can we do that would be very hard for our publishers to potentially do themselves, but we can do it at because we have scale, and that sort of is to the heart of um, that is to the heart of the aggregation. Okay. Um, How, do you have any thoughts or plans around hosting content in forms other than books and journals? I think that's for you. Yes. So as I said, um, the answer to that is yes, 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 yes. And yes, um, we are constantly experimenting because we do want to make the platform even richer as a research experience. Um, so some of the current ones, as I listed, were... Um, experimenting in the digital humanities. Um, we will be releasing um, case studies soon as a pilot program. Um, and we partnered, that's a great example of being part of a university as well, because that is a partnership coming out of the SNF Agora Institute. 
Um, uh, and then also I, I will emphasize, we really are looking for those yet to be defined um, pieces of content. Um, but I, I will say just to bring it back down a level, everything still must remain peer reviewed, right? So some of our experiments, we go forward and uh, there just hasn't been the chance for a lot of interesting work to have yet figured out how to go through a peer review process or identify a publisher and things like that. So that's where I'm grateful for Barbara's help as well, because when it comes into the publishing side of things, I can bring her into those conversations and have her sort of assist um, some of our potential partners um, through their own design of their own programs, because the content will be valuable to Muse and make the connection between the content on Muse even richer. So more connection points. And I think to get richer connection points, it does require us to keep sort of thinking out of the box or out of the book or the journal a little bit. Um, so I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Barbara? I would just say that the collaboration between Muse and our books division on uh, the complete prose of T.S. Eliot, where um, we're creating a new product on Muse, a reference product uh, from that eight volume printed uh, set of books. So the, the reference piece of that will be launching hopefully soon. Um, and uh, so, so that's one of, one of those um, new content types that, that we can talk about. And I think that question was from Becky Clark and we've actually talked, we'll be talking with her about that at some point. Okay, we didn't respect Becky Clark's privacy. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a friend of ours. Well, we, we wouldn't know it was from Becky Clark if she right, didn't right. actually say so. She yeah. could have said, I don't want to say. And so that's a real life example of the, the banter that occurs over privacy here at the yeah, press. Right. Um, and Barbara, how should we be advocates for humanities? Well, so here, here you know, I'll bring in my, my worldview. And I, I will say that the Karen Wolf's um, presentation and discussion really was fabulous because it made me and probably others think about their worldviews, right? And so for 34 years, I was publishing science, right? And then for four years, learning so much about the humanities and how humanists do their work. Um, it's been a real privilege for me uh, to, to have made that, that, that career change. Um, but I will say um, I have a lot of experience in, in communication of science. And um, I think that even though I say that sciences and humanities are quite different, I, I say that in the academic sense, but in communicating about the power and the value of the humanities, I think we can take um, some of the the work that, that, that we did at the National Academies on the science of science communication and apply that to, to the humanities because a lot of that work was supported by you know, the work of humanists and a lot of that work was supported by the research of social scientists and, and how people react to ways in which you can communicate the value of either the sciences or the humanities or, or anything else. And of course, Karen talked a little bit about storytelling and how important that is to the sciences, but it's also important to the humanities as we advocate for the humanities. We know, we know from research that um, if you give facts about something to a person and then you tell a story around it, they're like 10 times more apt to have, have be able to recall that story and to recall um, what was meant by that communication. And so, you know, and advocating for the humanities, I think we need to look um, to the research in, in humanities and to the research in social sciences um, as, as we go about that work. I also think, you know, just, you know, based on, on um, Karen's talk where she talked about the difference between the humanities and academia and public humanities. And my role early on in, in, in the 80s and 90s at the National Academies was around advocating for the value of basic science. And so that's analogous to the humanities and academia, right? Congress and other people who were supporting science and funding the National Science Foundation 
didn't want to support basic science anymore. They felt that it wasn't useful. So as, as Karen talked about yesterday, um, Russian language is now gone, you know, in, in most programs. And now we need it. It's the same thing with basic science. Basic science can turn into something else. You know, the, the basic science around lasers, you know, turned into a great application 20 years later. So the same thing is, you know, the Russian language is now important and look what we did to that. So there, there, there are analogies there that I think um, we can use as we try to advocate for all different kinds of humanities. And that like went on that. too long. <laughs> no, 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 it didn't go on too long because I'm gonna follow up with something very simplistic. And from the Muse standpoint, I would say, um, we can advocate for the humanities by continuing to do a very good job for the humanities, right? To continue doing what we're doing, promote uh, our trustworthy database platform and really promote our, our values. Um, um, and so by doing a good job and sticking to those values, I think that is a form of advocacy. And I don't know if I said that quite eloquently, but I, I feel it strongly. Mm -hmm. So a couple of other questions, um, and I'm looking at the time and I think we will have time for a few more. So please keep continuing to put them in. And if we do not have time today, we will make sure that we attempt to get back to you um, if you've identified yourself. Um, so, the next one is scholars often discuss the fact that peer review as a system is under stress for a variety of reasons. How can we as publishers, how can Muse help support, bolster this system we all rely on? I'm gonna let you go first, Barbara. I figured you would. Yes. It, it is a tough question. And those of us, um, who need to call on people to, to peer review. It's been very difficult during COVID. Um, people are incredibly busy. Um, those scholars who we look to and those researchers we look to to peer review what we do. Um, we, you know, as a, as a book publisher, for example, just continue to use the same system and, and you know, but, you know, open peer review, you know, that's been, that's been tested, I think, more in journals than, than for books. But Kathleen Fitzpatrick, uh, for her book, used some open peer review. I think she posted her book on PubHub. Um, we could talk with her about how, how that worked, um, but it doesn't seem to be a system that, that we're embracing at this point. Um, but it, it, is a, it is a tough question. And, and for Muse to be able to help with that, I'm just not sure you know, you can answer that piece of it, but I'm, I'm not sure how that would work. One of the things that our advisory board during our last advisory board meeting where we had breakout sessions on big ideas thought about the ways in which publishers could start out with an idea from an author and, and have that author the whole way through to a journal article or, or a book. And in between that, there would be content that would be put out to the public uh, for conversation that wouldn't necessarily be peer reviewed. And so that, that's kind of provocative. And it's, um, it's not something that we are implementing at this point, but it was one of the ideas that our very smart uh, advisory board members had at our last meeting. Um, so one of the questions I guess would be, if we decided that you should start to post content that isn't peer reviewed, um, how, how would that work? Right. It is. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, the peer review is where I do rely on my colleagues at the press to jump in since um, as of now, Muse's role is post peer review. Um, so we haven't um, sort of stretched our abilities to that part of the ecosystem. So um, and I'm not sure we should. So I'm not close to it, but I'm not sure we should either. So it's a discussion to be had because it, it, it comes up more and more. Um, but as those values of that trusted content come up, it's also important that we keep stressing that all of the content on the platform is peer reviewed, but I can 
also say that there are probably opportunities that we are missing because it's wonderful content. It would be useful content, but it is not um, peer reviewed um, to be included on the platform. Right. So. Okay. So here's a big one for the last five minutes of, um, um, well, there's a couple of really good big ones for the last five minutes. So um, I'm going to first answer one really quickly, which was when will S2O launch? And, you know, I hope by this time next year, we have talked to all of our partner publishers and all of our partner libraries, and we have something in place. At this moment in time, we have, I'll call it um, a draft program that we are now um, expanding um, for the reaction of others and others meaning um, first starting with publishers and then moving to libraries. Um, but we will not prematurely launch the program. It's a hard program to launch. Um, say. There's many tentacles that go into many different areas that we have to be sure that we get them, we get them right. Um, has oh, uh, one sec. So what are your biggest constraints running an aggregation at a press? I don't know who that question's for. Um, I, I don't feel any constraints. Um, maybe that's my problem. <laughs> so, you know, um, at a press. So, so maybe Wendy, if you if you could envision Muse as a standalone entity, what would be the benefits of that? Right. That's the kind of that 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 gets to what are the constraints, right, of being in a press. So, if you weren't in a press, what what benefits would there be? I don't know. Like that, that uh, my first reaction to that is I went into like the bottom of a deep, dark well, right? Because being embedded in a press, being embedded in a university, um, I'm never alone with any problem. There are so many areas for me to reach out to. Um, and then I get overwhelmed by saying, let's replicate um, all these logistical pieces that exist at a press or exist at a university that would just distract me from the part of the job, the part of my jobs that I love, right? It would be like running an organization versus promoting the humanities. So I think there's, there's more fear in that question than there is an answer, I think. So, um, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm on rapid speed, dating um, question asking now, but I want to make sure we get as many as possible. Has Muse had conversations with libraries about any role you might play in supporting library publishing? Many libraries support OA content that is undiscoverable and Muse furthers discovery. Mm. Um, I will answer that. That's actually one aspect well. of the outreach through subscribe to open that I'm looking forward to. There's going to be a lot of OA content that would benefit being connected to the corpus of content on the Muse platform and thus most likely become more discoverable that I think we're gonna find out as we start these conversations. Um, so that part of it, um, I'm enthusiastic about that because I think there's a lot of great OA content already existing that isn't as discoverable or as connected as it should be. And hopefully that sort of unearths during these conversations. So I appreciate that question very much. And hopefully it's peer review. Yes, it needs to be peer review. Um, so that brings us just about to time. And I just wanna steal one moment um, to extend a big thanks um, to the Muse staff for the tremendous amount of effort it takes to put on this meeting. Um, and they've done an amazing job. And I also want to say a particular big thanks to Barbara for being willing to have a very open and transparent conversation. And, and I extend my thanks too to you and, and to the team and uh, really look forward to further conversations um, that hopefully, um, you know, this, this sparked some, some of those conversations, but I'd like to keep, keep them going. So thank you.
Thank you so much. So we now have a 15 minute break and we'll rejoin for our final panel, Humanities Scholarship Brainstorming for the Future. So I hope to see you all there. So thank you very much. <laughs>